Nothing could be better on warm spring days than making beautiful white underwear like this Edwardian chemise. To draft the pattern I used making Edwardian costumes for women by Suzanne Rowland. The pattern is size 10 or 12. I was silly and thought that would do for my size 6 self. In the book each square in the grid is 5 square centimeters. Since it was a very simple pattern with only a few lines I made a grid of 10 square centimeter squares. If you're used to the imperial system, this pattern is easy enough to start your magic adventures. I only needed to make one half pattern as the front and back of the chemise are the same. Note that the shoulder is straight and not sloped. The instructions tell you to fold the fabric half lengthways, then to fold it half widthways and to place the pattern with the shoulders and center on the folds. This way, the shoulders are joined as you can see me demonstrated in miniature. I ended up with this. I hadn't curved the neck properly, but this issue could easily be addressed later. At first I sewed the side seams. I used the French seam where you first sew from the right side. I used running stitches, the original garment was hand sewn as well. I trimmed the allowance. It is much easier to make a French seam if you use a more liberal allowance than trim it back to 3mm, that is 1 eighth of an inch I think. I, however, obstinately made the same mistake of starting with a very narrow allowance every time. I gave it a good shake to get rid of all the fluff that I didn't want to enclose in my French seam. Then I turned the chemise to the wrong side. You should press the seam to give it a sharp edge, but I prefer using my fingers and nails when I'm feeling lazy. I stitch along the side seam again, encasing the seam allowance. This time I used the back stitch, but running stitches would have done as well. You have to be careful to stitch a bit under the edge of the hidden seam allowance. Next, I wanted to hem the chemise to avoid too much fraying. Because the side seam of the chemise was cut as a sloping line, the hem ended up forming an angle. Interestingly, to straighten the hemline, I had to cut in a curve at the sides. At this stage the chemise looked really big for my stick figure. I didn't have enough fabric when I cut the chemise, so I wanted to lose from its length as little as possible, so I decided to make a rolled hem. I folded the edge of the fabric by 2 mm. I creased it, but I only did it on a small section at a time. I inserted the needle just under the raw edge. I tried to catch only one or two threads, then I inserted the needle just under the top edge. 
Here it doesn't really matter if you catch a lot of the fabric, but make sure you only catch the folded edge, not both layers of fabric. Then I put my thread through, but not tight. I made 3 to 6, sometimes even 8 stitches before I pulled it tight, which created a rolled hem. I've read quite a few contemporary books and this is not the way they instruct you to make a rolled hem. You're supposed to literally roll the hem between your thumb and finger. I failed at rolling, but next time I will give it another try. I made the tucks in the front. When I was a bit tired of tucking, I roll hem the sleeves. The instructions say that you can adapt the pattern to fit your size by varying the number of tucks. This isn't really true if your two or three sizes is smaller. I made 18 tucks as on the original, but would have needed at least two more. However, a wide row of tucks would look ridiculous on a thin, flat-chested person as I am. I never mark all the tucks in advance because it is frustrating to see how many I still have to make. Maybe it is bad practice, but I always mark one at a time. I creased the fabric along the marks. Again, I was too lazy to use the iron. I created a guiding line by folding and creasing the fabric. I decided to practice stitching in a straight line without drawing a guiding line as I always do. Still, I needed at least some visual guidance. You, however, can do what is more sensible, that is, use a water-soluble or erasable pen or whatever modern sewists use. I used a backstitch to sew the tucks, which was a waste of time and energy. Next time I will really use a running stitch. I also wanted some tucks at the bottom. The plan was to make three, but I gave up after two. This chemise is a shameful reminder of my laziness. Here I indeed used the running stitch. This stitch is neat on the other side as well, unlike back stitching. I wanted to add some lace to the hem. I placed the lace on the right side of the hem and I cut just the edge of the hem and just the edge of the lace. And then I had to change the method because I started to experience the pain in my left hand which I had the hem with. With the first method the lace and hem were in line, using the second method the hem is a tiny bit more outward. I can't decide which look I prefer, but I know I don't like pain. Unfortunately I didn't have enough lace to embellish the sleeves. I curved the neck at the shoulders. I trimmed the frayed edge all around. At first I wanted to fold back the edge twice and whip it out of laziness, but it wouldn't have looked nice with the tucks, so I decided to cut a band. The meter rod was a great help again. I gathered the back. A gathered back is the most unflattering thing on me. I will never ever make a gathered back again. It took me a long time to determine where to position the gathers so that they are the least unflattering.
I stitched on the neckband. I wasn't sure how to go on. I trimmed and pressed the allowance upward, folded the edge of the band and whip stitched it. I added some beautiful slotting lace. I stitched it to the bottom of the standing neck band because I didn't like the look of it on top of the band. I had no ribbon. It'll take me some time until I can get something because I only want vintage ribbon. By the way, the laces I use are always vintage or antique. I always try to include a touch of the past in the making of my garments. This gives a continuation to the life of these objects while they connect me with the history of the time when they were made. I am amazed by the beauty humans can create and find it fascinating that these objects were made or touched by long gone people. I wish to pay my respect to them by using vintage and antique items. If you like this video, please give it a thumb up, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon if you want to get a notification when I upload a new video.